my name is Nicole Simone Shaver, and uh, I believe that I'm a miracle of light brought from darkness. And um, I'm not going to go and tell every little situation into detail because we would be here all night, but I am going to touch base on a lot of things that have impacted me over my life um, in my childhood and throughout the years that made me who I am today. Um, I always felt like I never belonged. Um, I never had a sense of feeling like I was okay or a sense of feeling like I was loved for a very long time. And it started back when I was probably about, I would say four is my first real feelings of just, I didn't even want to be in my house. And I was scared of my living situation and the people who were around me. Um, I come from a very dysfunctional family of addicts and abuse and um, a lot of horrible things. And um, I don't I don't remember my father around much when I was younger. I know him and my mom had uh, kind of parted ways back when uh, I was probably about two or three. And uh, my mom hooked up with the maintenance man at our apartment complex. Um, and uh, things just spiraled down from there. Um, I remember at a very young age uh, being abused um, for little things like just not putting in another toy away before bringing another toy out. Um, things normal kids do, you know, and uh, it, I, I never understood it, but I knew I was always scared. I always had this feeling that I was terrified um, to just live and be in my own home, to even sleep, to even wake up another day. Um, there was always a lot of arguing in our house. And, uh, the first time thing that I remember, um, was my mom being abused by her boyfriend and, uh, it was pretty horrific. Um, I remember blood being everywhere and hearing the screams and was trying to hide and glass breaking and yelling. And, you know, I, I didn't understand what it was. I mean, I was only like four years old. And I just had a, a little brother that was born um, from my mom and her boyfriend. And I had this time, I, we also had my older brother who was there. And uh, I just remember fear. Like, I was always scared of this man, um, terrified. Uh, he, would, he would literally haunt me while I was awake. And uh, he would haunt me in my dreams, nightmares, I guess you would want to call them. Um, I could never get the sound of, of my mom screaming out of her head and then he would still be there cops would come and and the next day he would be back it, it was it was kind of like that cycle over and over again um for a long time um i remember finally being able to go to kindergarten and being able to get out of the house and so i love school I, I love to wake up every morning and go to school and i looked forward to it because i knew that uh, I didn't have to be at home and I didn't have to deal with that and I didn't have to listen to that. And um, I loved it. And uh, I would go to school and I did good for a little bit, but everything at my home and in my home life kind of started to overpour there. Um, I was very, um, I guess you could say, a, a rambunctious child, a very uh, uh, bad child. I like to, to get into stuff. I stole from my teacher. I would get into fellow students' desk and steal from them. I would pick fights a lot. And this was in kindergarten. I remember my very first time um, getting in trouble. A boy had uh, pushed me and I turned around and just hauled off and pushed him back. And he had scissors in his hand and he sliced his hand open. And I got the living daylight speed out of me when I got home because God forbid my mom get pulled off the sofa from her soap operas and doing nothing to have to come down and, and deal with the situation, you know, like a normal parent, you know, it, it always, she always made me feel like her life, you know, like I was taking up space in her life. Like I was a waste of, you know, just being there. Like she didn't like me. Um, it didn't matter that I felt I was defending myself. It, it, it didn't matter what the situation was. I was always wrong. Always. Um, so from then, I mean, things were still happening in our house and the abuse was still taking place. Um, I remember uh, I had a, a, a bathroom problem 
I guess you can say a bathroom problem. I, uh, it was a problem with my bladder. I have a tilt and an abnormally small um, bladder. So I would pee the bed all the time, even when I was older every night. And um, I was supposed to have surgery. And for some reason, whatever, my mom didn't feel like putting me through that. And so I kept wetting the bed every night. And I would get my ass whipped for it the next day because her boyfriend didn't like it. And uh, it was pretty much what he said went in our home. Uh, my mom cowered to him, and she did whatever. It didn't matter, and I, I don't ever really remember my mom ever sticking up for us. It, it was kind of like, you know, we were in their way. Um, I was probably about six when I finally uh, made a friend in, in school. His name was Aaron Almond. Um, he was, like, one of my best friends, and he was the only one at that time that I would tell what was going on with me. Um, he was nice to me. He would bring me snacks from home because he knew that we didn't have anything. And, you know, I was always the type of kid that came there and I always came and hand me down. Sometimes my brother's clothes, um, clothes that my grandfather would, would dumpster dive out of the trash can and my grandmother would wash because we didn't have anything. And, and, uh, food, we didn't, we didn't really have much of that either. And it was much of a surprise because, you know, my mom was on government aid. Um, I didn't realize later tell why we didn't have stuff but at the time you know I didn't understand why um so going to school and getting those meals at school you know that's all I would have and so he would always bring me snacks and he'd be very nice to me and teach me soccer and and I would tell him everything and then um about uh by the time I was eight uh he was out playing ball and I guess got hit by a semi and dragged and then hit again and uh the teacher's came in and and they talked to us and took us out and they took me to a counselor and I had to draw about it and um I'm sorry it it was pretty hard because I I I lost one of the only people that I could talk to um in my childhood because I never felt like I had anybody that understood me anybody that I can go to with my secrets that wouldn't say anything and uh after that um I even went farther downhill from there um the abuse was getting worse at home um, my mother would even partake in the abuse. Um, I, there was a time where, you know, I had an accident in the bathtub and, um, I remember her holding me underwater and I just remember the look on her face and it looked like she was possessed and she just kept my head underwater and my brother came in and he yelled and she, she let me up and, you know, things just kept getting worse. They were chaotic and it was just, it was a very horrible thing. Like it's, it was so chaotic. Sometimes I, I couldn't even get my work done at school because I was just so like exhausted from home and then being able to come home from school and try to be able to do my homework. It just, it it wasn't, it wasn't something that was able to get done and my grades were slipping. Um, this time, uh, my, my little brother was already a little bit older and, uh, you know, um, the abuse was obviously still happening. And one day we were playing and, and he pinched me and I pinched him back. And, uh, his dad got mad because he screamed and, um, he choked me. And I don't remember too much of what happened next. I just remember my older brother waking me up, holding me in the bathroom, splashing water on my face. I remember that it felt like I was going on a roller coaster. And then I open my eyes and, you know, my brother's holding me up in the bathroom and we walk out of the bathroom and my mom's on the back of him with a baseball bat around his neck, fighting him. And he's trying to fight to get her off and beat her up. And she finally got the cops involved um, when it came to us and they came there and it, it was a scary process because they sat there and they took pictures of my neck and took my statement and took my brother's statement and and I didn't know what was going on. I just knew I was scared and I didn't want him to come back. And, you know, it, it was just, um, something that I will never get out of my mind because I really truly felt like I almost died that day. Um, the abuse kept on and my mom of course took him back and, um, it was pretty crazy because I never understood the relationship that him and my mom had. I mean, you know, I had my little brother and then he was cheating on her with another woman and there was that other baby that he had and then she had my sister with him and 
after the baby that she had and and this person that he was cheating on her with like we would end up going over to the birthday parties together and and my mom would bring us over there and it was like if they were kind of both in this relationship with him and it was very weird and I never understood it but I knew that like the things because my mom would tell me things and and I knew that this was the woman that he was cheating on her with and my mom would beat on her and and I mean my mom he would beat on my mom and he would beat on her. And, and I just, it never made sense to me as a kid. And I was exposed to a lot of things and like well, things were never monitored growing up. And, um, it, it got to that point where I, I don't know what finally made my mom leave the situation, but she finally did. Um, and it was a big, it, it was a big weight lifted off my shoulders, but the fact that, I mean, I had to go back to court and, and see counselors and relive it and everything and explain the abuse. You know, it, it did a lot to me because I didn't want to keep reliving it. I, I just wanted to block it out. I mean, uh, I'm telling you guys bits and pieces, but when I mean like it was horrific and there was times I was locked in my room and there was times that I wasn't given food, it it was it was pretty horrific um, experience as a child and it impacted me a lot in my life and I felt that it was a lot of the reasons why I made a lot of the decisions that I did. Um, my mom ended up getting with uh, one of the guys that used to run around the street where we lived and um, uh, we were with him for a while and my mom was still abusive to us and um, she wasn't the love mom, loving mom. I don't ever remember her like hugging me and, and telling me she was proud of me. I don't remember her telling me she loved me or a good job or, you know, things that you're supposed to tell your child and give them encouragement. And that didn't happen in our household. Um, she was with him. And then, uh, I ended up having another little sister. And, uh, I would like to say around the time I was 11, um, my mom had found out that she had possible, um, like some tumors and some growths in her uterus. And, and, you know, she had a cancer scare and, um, I came home one day and uh, we were sitting there and he was like, I don't, I don't know what made her boyfriend say what he said to me, but he said it. And he was like, you know, um, if something happens to your mom, you know, your brothers and sisters, they all have family to go to. They all have someone who's willing to take them. Something happens to your mom. No one's going to take you. You don't have a dad. You don't have no family willing to take you. And, uh, Believe it or not, at 11, I knew he wasn't lying. I knew that I had I had nobody like my brothers and sisters. I was the oddball out, um, the scapegoat of the family, the one who always got the blunt of everything, the one who always caught the blame of everything. And so I knew, like, he wasn't lying. I didn't know my dad. I didn't know nothing. And I legit had it set in my mind that night when I went to bed. Um, I packed the bag. And I left my school books out and I packed some clothes and I went to school that day knowing that I wasn't coming home. And at 11 years old, I left and I snuck off with my friend and I didn't come home. And uh, they eventually called the police. And first, you know, um, because my teacher had kind of known stuff about me. I had had her for two years. Um, Her name was Mrs. Oldham. And... uh, she kind of knew a little bit about the things that was going on. I wouldn't say really knew, but I would come to school with like black eyes and, you know, not disheveled. I I mean, I didn't always have the best stuff on and I, I wasn't the most smiley kid, you know, you can see it when a kid's going through stuff. And I, I really believe that she knew because the police, before they ever did a search for me, tore my mother's house up from top to bottom thinking that she did something to me that they that something had happened to me um the search went on and they went looking through like the woods and the mountains and even my older brother was and i never turned up and then um they went back to the school and they uh called my teacher and she pulled you know a student list of of people who i was friends with and you know um like the next day it was kind of like the afternoon uh, my friend, her name was Andrea, um, the phone rang and she picked up the phone and she was like, it's for you. And I was like, what? So I got on the phone and it was my teacher. And she was like, you know, Nicole, I, 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 I understand. And I, I know you're scared, but you got to come out. 
you 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 got to come out and you got to talk to the police and, and you got to let them know that you're okay you got everybody looking for you and um so i was like all right and the cops came and they got me and um they talked to me for a little bit and i told them what was said and what had happened and somewhat a little bit of what was going on i was always too scared because you know um my mom always put it in my head that I would be taken away and I, I would never see my brothers and sisters again. So I didn't want to say anything that I knew that would break us siblings apart. And so a lot of this stuff I kept quiet um, out of fear for us siblings, not out of fear for her, but out of fear for us siblings. And so um, that day they, had, they took me over to my grandparents' house and uh, my dad was on the phone. And uh, I haven't talked to him since I was a child. And uh, he, he was, I guess, because the police reached out to him thinking that I might have went to his house. And uh, he told me he, he was going to come and see me and, you know, and uh, why I did it. And I told him why I did it. And I told him what I was going through. And I told him that, you know, I was being hurt and I, I would want to come and live with him. And he was like, you know, we'll meet up and. Um, I never heard from him. I, I mean, I'm not going to say never, but I didn't hear from him again in, in that period of time as being a child. Um, so uh, at this time, I was 11, and I'd, already, I'd started getting in a lot of fights and um, getting expelled from school, getting kicked out of school. Teachers didn't want to put up with me anymore. It, it was really bad. Um, going home and and just school and everything was just, it was a complete mess. I was a complete mess. I, I was already spiraling out of control and there was something inside of me, like part of me, I didn't want to live anymore. I, I just, I just didn't. And I, and I knew that there was always a talk of God because when I was little, we were forced to go to church every Sunday and, and I never really put too much thought into it because it was always impacted in my mind of if, if there was a God, why is this happening to me? Like, I never understood what the big concept was or what the bigger picture was when when I was younger. And so, you know, I strayed away from, from that. And I had always said that I was anti-God and, and I was into, like, witchcraft. And I started getting into, you know, um, hanging out with bad crowds. And I considered, like, now I considered myself looking back like a chameleon. I kind of tried to fit in where I could just to be loved and just to be accepted. So if I needed to act hood, I can easily put on that and that could. If I need to be a skater, I could put that on and act skater. And that's just how it was for me. I kind of just went with the flow and, and got in with the bad crowds and I started kicking it with gang members by the time I was 12 years old. And at this time we had lived in Pomona, California. And um, uh, I was just teaching school. I was already smoking pot. Um, smoking cigarettes, just running around, staying out late, not always coming home. Um, just, I never really wanted to be home. It, it was, it was just, I, anything I could do to just be away from there, I would do it. Um, I kept on that until I was about 13. And, uh, this is when I really started to take a down, downpour. Um, I went out with one of the neighborhood girls and uh, we were just supposed to have a couple of drinks, smoke a little pot, you know, hang out with some guys. And, and you know, I didn't think nothing of it. She was like, you know, let me bring you along. I'll introduce you to, to my guy friend, Joey. He's cool, you know, da, da, da. you know, and um, you now I was only 13 and she knew it. And uh, so we went off and we were kicking it in some hills and um, drinking, having a few beers and, and smoking weed and uh got in the car with her and, and her friend, um, the guy, Joey. And, uh, at the time I thought he was 19. Um, but it turns out later he wasn't, he was well into his twenties, but, uh, he offered me, um, to try something. And at the time I, I didn't know what it was. And my friend was like, it's, it's okay. You know, try it. You'll feel good. Da, da, da. So I was like, okay, dumb me, you know, and I tried it and it was LSD. And um, a lot of that night, um, it kind of is blotchy, but I remember the most of it. Um, I was really messed up, and um, 
you know, he was kissing on me and stuff like that, you know, and, you know, I, I was still, uh, as you would say, you know, I, I, I hadn't been with anybody. I was still a virgin and, and stuff like that. And, and none of, nothing like that was ever on my mind. You know, like I, I liked getting into the bad thing and hanging out with boys and, and stuff like that, but not to the point to take it to that next level. That was never something that was on my mind. Cause I was always like a tomboy type. And, uh, I remember just being really sloppy. Like, I, I was really sloppy and uh, kind of going in and out. And I remember spinning. And I remember getting in the car, and they were trying to drive around to find a motel. And, and the first motel we went to, um, you know, we were about to check in. And uh, I remember him carrying me because I wasn't able to walk. And uh, an Indian lady came out, and she was like, no, 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 no. And I remember her saying, no, 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 you need to leave. You know, um, we're not having none of that here. You need to leave. And uh, so we left, you know, and I was kind of still spinning in and out of it. And then we ended up at uh, another motel. Um, later I found out it was the Red Roof Motel. Um, and uh, I remember Charlene and, 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 and the other guy, you know, uh, Fernando had left. And I was in the room alone, and uh, I remember using the bathroom, and I walked out, and I kind of stumbled and laid in the bed. And I don't remember, you know, what happened in between there. But then I remember um, waking up in the middle of him um, raping me. And um, I remember trying to push him off of me and telling him, stop, don't, it hurt, and... He wouldn't stop. He just kept doing whatever he was, and I was blacking in and out. And uh, I remember coming a little bit, too, when it was over with. And um, I know there was blood all over me, and I put my clothes back on. And I went into the bathroom, and I turned the water on in the tub, and I blocked the tub. And I sat fully clothed in the tub of water. And I don't know what I was thinking at the time, but I thought I could drown myself, and um, I was attempting to. Um, the water was overfilling, and they were banging on the door. I remember Charlene banging on the door, Nicole, 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 and I just wouldn't say anything. Like, I just wanted to die. I, I just wanted my life to end. Um, and eventually they got in the bathroom, and she pulled me out. She put me in the bed, and then I remember going to sleep. Um... I remember waking up to the motel phone ringing and I answered the phone and they said that uh, the police were outside and I looked around and I turned over and that guy was still lying in the bed next to me and Charlene was on the ground sleeping and I woke him up and I was like, they said the cops are outside and um, everybody got up and started getting dressed and you know, and I was already clothed, and the cops were at the door, and, you know, they questioned me, and I was so terrified, I was so freaking scared, and they were like, well, you know, what happened, they had seen the blood in the bed, and I, I lied to them, and I told them that, um, I started my period, and, uh, <laughs> lied about my age and everything, and I don't know how I got away with it, and I don't know how they didn't see it, but they didn't, and, uh, he ended up dropping us back off at um, my friend Charlene's, and um, I went home that day, and I was scared to go inside the house, and so Charlene went in before me, and uh, I don't know what conversation her and my mom had, but then I, I came in, and she was like, you don't look well, I, I should take you to the hospital, and uh, Charlene was like, you know, I'm going to go, Nicole, you could tell your mom, I was gonna, I'm going to go. And uh, I told my mom, you know, um, that I was raped. And my mom told me, like, pretty much that she thought I was lying. That because what I was doing and because who I was running around with and because I was hanging out, that, you know, I, I pretty much put myself in that situation. And, you know, she didn't believe me. Um, so I grabbed clothes and I, and I ran. And I ran away that night and I stayed gone. And I was running around um, the streets of Pomona and uh, found myself hooked up with a 
with a very shady group of characters. Um, I was running around with a lot of gang members and stuff, and um, I was uh, met a couple characters and uh, that I knew with another girl that was my friend. I don't really want to mention names, but uh, um, uh, one night sitting in their room, and they're like, you know, they were in there and they were smoking something out of a glass pipe, a round glass pipe, and I was like, what is that? And they were like, oh, you know, it's just tweak, you know, meth. What does it do? Well, it keeps you awake and keeps your mind clear. And, you know, at that time, I was already had a case of the, you know, the efforts. I didn't care about anything. Uh, what else can go worse than what already happened, you know? And I, and I, and I smoked it. And, uh, you know, at the time, you know, it made me feel like I didn't care and I didn't think about anything that happened to me. I didn't care what anybody thought of me. I didn't care about anything. I was high and my mind was just off of all of that. I, I, I just didn't have a care in the world. And um, I was running around with these characters for a minute. And um, uh, I would say um, I was in and out of juvenile hall a lot. Um, for stupid stuff uh one of them was weed possession i got caught with some marijuana across from from the high school and it was a ticket and i never showed so it became a thing and you know i was in and out and then um i was in high school and um they would have a lot of riots over there um between a lot of you know um at the time i guess you could call them race riots at the time you know a lot of the um the Mexicans and the blacks would always fight a lot. And, you know, I always hung out with a lot of the Mexicans. And so, you know, it was a big thing. And um, I got caught in the middle of it. And um, I ended up getting caught by uh, one of the school campus officers. And uh, for, you know, this girl, she sli she'd like sliced me with a box cutter on my arm. And I had took a screwdriver and you know, I, I didn't do anything severe or anything, but it didn't matter. Like, I, I ended up in juvie, and, you know, I was there for, like, a few weeks, and then my mom finally came and got me out, and it was kind of like a like a vicious cycle. Like, I, I would go in for two weeks, I would come out, my mom would come and get me, and then something would happen, and, and my mom would report me as a runaway because she didn't want to lose her food stamps, even though she kicked me out, and I'd be back in again once they caught me. Um... I remember uh, when um, I was 14, um, I was steady on the streets. I didn't really go back, went back home. I was running around with way older men than I should have been running around with. And, you know, um, you know, just not, not being very smart. I was already stealing. I was already stealing cars. I was already robbing stores. And it wasn't necessarily really for my habit, but it was to survive. You know, I would steal food. I would steal um, alcohol to stay warm at night when I was sleeping on the streets because I didn't have nowhere to go and I had to be up, you know, um, or I would be stealing um, clothes because I didn't have clothes. Um, so, I, I mean, and some of it, you know, you know, went towards my habit, but I wasn't, I wasn't fully, you know, that far deep into my addiction like I would do it here and there but it wasn't like an everyday thing um and then I um had got you know I was at my friend's one time and I had uh came across uh this guy and um I I knew his brother and I was friends with his brother and he rolled up in a car with a girl I didn't like and um how we met was because I pulled the girl out of the car and we started fighting because me and her had a lot of beef and and then uh, after she ran off and left, he looked at me and he was like, you want to roll? And I was like, sure, you know, whatever. And uh, we rolled around and um, he took care of me. Um, you know, I was 14 and he was 18, but I lied about my age at the time. And, um, uh, but he was good to me. You know, it, it, it wasn't about drugs. You know, um, we did do a lot of crime together and stuff like that. And, but, he always made sure that I had somewhere safe to sleep. He always made sure that I had food to eat. He even took his taxes from his work and bought me clothes and um, an engagement ring. And, you know, this is the first time I had ever felt 
any type of connection ever since my my friend Aaron and um uh I thought I was in love you know how that goes and uh he and we end up getting uh pop coming down from um uh Aldi. He swerved, I guess he was up too too long or whatever. Said he seen a dog, but I don't remember ever there being a dog. And um, there was a cop behind us, and they followed us for a long time. And next thing you knew, there was cops everywhere. Um, well, we were in a stolen car, and we had two other people with us. And uh, we went to jail that night, and um, uh, they were like, you know, you're 14. You know, we're going to get him on statutory rape, and... And I was like, hold on. I was like, I lied. You know, I lied about my age. I, I didn't, he didn't know I was 14. You know, I, I didn't want him to get in trouble. It wasn't his fault. He, he, he didn't really know. And, and even my mom had told him that I was 18. She lied for me because that's the type of person she was. And, uh, so they called and they verified it. And my mom admitted that she did lie about my age for me and, um, that she was okay with our relationship so they didn't charge him on statutory rape they did get him for you know um the the car theft and everything and then i did go and i went in for like a couple weeks in juvie and my mom came and got me out and same thing again here we go again with my mom and her her freaking craziness because she would be spun out all the time and we just couldn't be in the same room she was always high she there was nothing you could ever do to please this woman nothing I remember one time I was making mashed potatoes and they weren't being done the way she liked them. And we got in a little bit of an argument and she tried to freaking stab me like with a fork at my face, like just crazy things. My mom was like that. My mom would just full fledged come at me like she was possessed with the devil inside of her over nothing, you know, and and I bounced out again. I I couldn't be there. You know, it just I, I wasn't doing it anymore. And. So I left and uh, I was running around the streets and I was making bad choices because I was hanging out with people that he knew and they were going back and they were telling him stuff that wasn't true. And, you know, I mean, looking at it now, I mean, I can't blame him for believing those things. But, you know, a lot of the things weren't true. Some were, but some weren't. And, you know, I didn't really, you know, um, do a lot of good things out there. So, I mean, it was easy for people to believe all the bad stuff and, so uh, we weren't together anymore, and, and my heart was crushed. I, I lost somebody that I loved, and and uh, he didn't want to be with me no more. And, uh, you know, again, there was somebody that I had taken away from me, and so I had it imprinted on me that, like, I was never going to ever find anybody to love me. No one was ever going to love me. No one loved me, and that's how I felt. I truly felt like no one loved me, um, and I was never, ever going to be happy in my life that I was just going to do whatever I wanted to because I might as well because it didn't matter if I did good anyways, you know, so I was going to do whatever I wanted. Um, at this By this time, my mom was already with, with another guy and uh, was already pregnant with, you know, another kid and um, still, she was still running around in that dope scene while she was pregnant. You know, I remember <clears throat> uh, walking down the street with my cousin Alicia and we were approaching my house and I hear my mom yelling, and uh, there's, like, two girls and a guy in a car. My mom's pregnant. Like, she's legit about to burst, and she's fighting, you know, this girl. So, of course, you know, not out of protection for my mom, but out of protection for the baby. Like, I ran up, and, you know, I started fighting these grown women and grown and grown men trying to get them off my mom, and, and it was a big old thing. And, like, my brother came out in his boxers out the shower, and, you know, they ended up driving away, and... You know, that's the kind of life, like, we always had to see just, like, chaos, just, like, every single day. I don't think there was ever a day of peace in our household. My mom always had herself neck deep in some bull crap, and it always affected every single one of us kids. We were never in a position for her to have as many kids as she did. I don't ever really remember my mom having a job, but maybe twice, at, like, a ready pack and a Macy's, and they didn't last very long. Like, it's... It, it's like she just kept bringing more kids into this world of chaos and different men were always in our lives and 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 it was always abusive like she was always it wasn't just with that first guy every single relationship she had it was chaos abuse and just chaos 
um, I remember when I was uh, 15 and uh, I snuck into the house one day and, uh, you know, snuck into my mom's room. I was looking to steal some food stamps. That was back when they were still paper. And um, I was going to go get me some food because she would always have a lock on the kitchen so we could never go in there and um, to get into anything. And so um, I went to steal some food stamps and I opened up her drawer and I seen some what I thought were just marijuana joints, you know, marijuana joints. I was going to take a joint and uh, I went down the street and I was smoking it with my friend and um, it hit really hard. Like it wasn't weed, you know, it, it seriously was not weed. And uh, I, next thing you know, like I'm already, my head's like, wow, 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 wow. And here comes my mom barreling down the alley and she snatches me up by my hair, drags me back down to down to the house beats the holy living crap out of me and come to find out it was weed laced with crack cocaine and you know why would just leave that in an open place who knows but you know i did it and i got my ass in trouble for it and um i just that night you know i slept out in the living room i didn't have a room like we never lived in the house where all of kids, us kids had room so we were kind of like piled up on top of each other and um her boyfriend came home that night and he had already known what had happened and i got woken up with him kicking the shit out of me with his boots on and throwing me out of the house telling me that i needed to go find and replace what i had smoked and um so I took off. I took off and I went down the street to a neighborhood kid's house. And uh, he, he was also a mutual friend of my older brother's. And, um, you know, I, I heard my brother come looking for me. And his friend lied to him and told him, um, you know, that I wasn't there. And, uh, you know, um, that was all because I didn't know what he had planned. Um, he was going to try to take advantage of me. And, um, this time I was able to actually, you know, fight the person off because I wasn't, you know, um, under the influence and drunk out of my mind. So I was able to escape and leave. And, um, so luckily I didn't have it happen to me another time. Um, but I left and I ran and I was back down on the South side of Pomona, kicking it with some shady characters and, you know, at this time, I was already learning how to run guns and, and you know, stealing cars and just anything that I can do that had to do with, with that type of life. I was already involved with it. I was 15 selling dope um, to grown people. And, I every, like, the majority of the people that I was around were grown men. And I don't mean, like, in their 20s. I mean late 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s. And I was 15 and, you know, it, it was like nothing. Like all, all of us neighborhood kids that were pretty much teenagers were around these group of men and, and they would, you know, give us drugs or take drugs from us, do drugs with us and, and she even try to like get at you. And, and that's how it was like, and I never thought anything of it. I, I was just like, you know, this is, you know, it was normal. It was a normal way of living life for me I was so used to it and I was so used to it that, that it I didn't even think twice about the fact that these guys were old enough to meet my father and my grandfather you know and so that, it continued on for a while and uh, I got myself in pretty deep with some of the wrong people when it came down to the drugs and stuff and um I ended up back in jail and uh my mom came and picked me up again, and this time when she picked me up, you know, she brought me my brother's clothes because, you know, I, she didn't have anything for me, and I remember she even brought me his lug boots because I remember they were flopping off of me, and uh, she decided that they were going to drive me out from Pomona to Joshua Tree, California, and drop me off at my cousin's house, and she said it was going to be for a little bit, but she left me. She literally took me and placed me at my cousin's and abandoned me and didn't come back for me, didn't give me no money, didn't bring me no clothes, didn't bring me nothing, just left me high and dry. Um, I was living with my cousin for a while. My cousin was on drugs. My cousin was already shooting meth and had a lot of shady characters around her. And um, I fell in with a really bad crowd. Um, 
and I, and I'll and I'll get into detail about that because this is something that it, that has a lot to do with a lot of the things that affected me. Um, because um, I grew up knowing that my mom's boyfriend, the first one that was very abusive, you know, wasn't my dad. It was a parent. You know, um, I'm a little Italian white girl, and you know, um, he was African American. He was black, and um, so the characters that my cousin was around. You know, there are a lot of white people, and uh, I guess, you know, I'm just going to come straight out and say it, but they were skinheads, and um, it was easy with my story and my background to fall into what their belief system was, and that they fed off of it because I was actually somebody who actually had some type of reason not to like black men, and they liked that, you know, it, 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 so I was around them, and... um running the streets and getting high and um, doing criminal activities for a while. And, uh, you know, I was there that whole year. I mean, there, there wasn't anything that I that, that had changed, you know. Um, I would say it was like, I wouldn't say a whole year, um, almost 17. And I was hanging around with, with one of the girls that I had met. And I was sneaking in her house. She would sneak me in and... Um, so one night she was sneaking me in her house and her mom caught me and uh she was like oh you need to go back out where you came in and so I went to do that and she was like no better yet come through the house so I came back in and I came through the house and I was leaving and, and you know my friend she was like but well, mom she has nowhere to go and da 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 and she started crying and and she was like sit down she was like what's going on and so you know, I told her, you know, like, I, I can't be at my cousin's house. She freaks out on drugs, and she trips out on me, and she throws me out, and um, she acts weird, and, you know, I really, I don't know nobody up here. My mom left me, and so um, this wonderful lady by the name of Donna let me stay there, and her one condition was that I not be on drugs, and so I was like, all right, bet, you know, I'm going to do this, you know, um, she started letting me stay there, and, uh, like, it happened so fast. Like, it was just so fast. Like, she already started, like, to go in and uh, get a hold of, like, the authorities and the court system to try to get my mom to sign over custody of me and relinquish her rights so she could get me health care and, and get me into the school. And it happened so quick. Like, this lady was on the ball. Like, I mean, within a month, two months, she already had temporary guardianship from me of me and she had me in Yucca Valley High School and you know I, I I mean I wasn't on meth but once in a while I would smoke some pot you know and um but I wasn't doing anything else and I was still smoking cigarettes but that was about it like once in, once in a, may, in a while maybe some marijuana but I wasn't doing anything hard I, I was really trying to be straight you know and uh it, it was it was awesome this this woman just like was a mother that I never had. She was so compassionate. She was so loving. She would do spontaneous trips at like three o'clock in the morning, and we would go to the beach. And she would take us kind of, all these kind of places, and she would find the clothes. And she was good to me. And I, I effed it up. Um, I started. Uh, I don't know. I just. I don't know what happened and, and where it went wrong, but I know that uh, I ditched school, and she caught us. And, um, she wasn't going to let us go, uh, to the, the, um, hall, the, the, uh, Winterfest dance. And I was, I knew I was being nominated, uh, for Winterfest queen. And so I was like, what are you doing? Why would you take this for me? Like, this is like the first, you know, I was so upset for it. I didn't even see why I was at fault for doing what I did. And I packed my bag and I left. And I went down the street, back to my cousin's house, and I was upset that day, and um, uh, my cousin was there, and she had some guy there, and um, he had dope on him, and there it went, you know, all, all those months I had gone, um, I, I don't know why, uh, I do not absolutely know why. I don't know what I was thinking, and I I, I want to say, yeah, 
was the part, partly the drugs, but it was so much more than that. It was my emotional and mental and physical state that prompted me just to throw everything away and not give a F about anything at that moment to where I left with this man. I was 17 and he was well into his 40s and I started hanging out with him and I was like, all right, cool, whatever. You know, he was the dope man. He was a cook. And um, I ended up getting pregnant at 17 by this 40-year-old man. And, oh, man, and I was I had to eventually stop going to school. I didn't go to school anymore because at the time I still was. I would literally be with this man and then leave and go to high school and then come home. Like, oh, my God. And, like, it was nothing. Like, I, I never thought anything of it at all and um he was abusive to me uh on several occasions while i was pregnant um he would have me and force me to stay in places um while he was cooking dope while i was pregnant i was not using that uh, while i was pregnant with my first daughter i was clean um because he probably would have killed me if he thought that I was, you know, doing anything. Um, I knew in my mind, I was like, I'm not going to be in a situation like my mom. I'm not going to put myself in that, like, like I need to get out of here. Like, I know I'm pregnant, but I cannot be with this man. But I was scared to leave because he would always find me. No matter where I went, he would always find me. And he was violent, and he was very dangerous and you know I was a tough girl and I'm not scared of nobody you know I, I'd fight dudes and I and I would take a hit back but something in me like made me I felt like I was like I was weak because I had to protect my baby inside of me so I, I, I there was not a lot I can do I felt like I was helpless and um, one day we were sitting in an apartment complex and uh, um, the they were cooking dope in there, and uh, the cops were knocking on the door and banging on the door, and they were going to come in. I guess they were waiting for their warrant. You know, they were trying to throw all this shit away from, like, uh, excuse my language, but they were trying to sh throw all the crap away, you know, evidence-wise and stuff like that. And and uh, he was going to jump of the bathroom window, and he left me in there. And he just, he went out, and he crawled on top of the roof and just left me. Like, didn't even care, nothing, like, and, um, there was this one guy there, um, he was a good friend, uh, his name was Roy, um, he was a gay guy, and he was one of the coolest dudes I've ever met in my life, and he was like, I got you, and so, he, we, we, he helped me get out the window, he got out the window, the cops were closing in, and he goes, I'm gonna run towards them, you hide. And sure enough, he did. He ran towards them. I ran around the building. I couldn't get that far because, like, the part where I was running to was all swarmed with cops. So there was this big brush of bushes right in front of, like, that apartment underneath the window. But they kind of had, a like, a like a sea cutout, like, where you could literally hide on the ground. But the bush came and, like, circled and curved over me. And I laid in that bush all freaking night till morning there was mice coming up to me I peed on myself and I laid there and they never found me and everybody else got busted and arrested um I thought that I got away scot-free and um two days later I was in the same apartment complex but at a different house chilling with the lady and trying to figure out what was I gonna do not even thinking that they found my backpack with my stuff in it um, and the cops showed up there and they were coming there for another guy who was on parole and I had to be there. And, um, I remember officer Mason cause he's the nicest cop I ever met. And, uh, they arrested me and, um, it was him and officer Dykoff and I never liked officer Dykoff. I knew he was a really shady cop. I knew he had his hands in with, with a lot of, um, bad things, uh, he would always try to get the girls on the streets when he'd catch them, you know, to do things with them. 
um, to let him go. And I knew this about him. Like, he had this reputation on the streets. So I was terrified. I did not want to be in this cop's car. And I cried to Officer Mason. I was like, please, can you take me? Because they had to trans. They couldn't keep me at the jail up here. They had to transfer me and actually physically take me themselves down to San Bernardino Juvenile Hall from Joshua Tree. So Officer Mason drove me. And uh, he was nice, and he was polite, and he had me handcuffed in front. He let me sit in the front seat. He even took me through McDonald's drive through and we talked about, like, my life to this cop. And I don't know, but I think he felt bad for me. And uh, I ended up being in jail um, for a couple weeks. After a few threats, my mom finally came and got me. And because uh, she didn't want it, she was going to leave me there. But I was like, I'm pregnant, like can't leave me here like I'm not too far about to be having this baby like please and it was like um around uh October and so a week before my 18th birthday she came and got me out um I was with her in her home in Corona um at this time you know she was still on drugs but um she did, she wasn't trying to get crazy with me anymore like that. I don't know. You know, she wasn't trying to, like, really be too stupid at first. Um, I had I was in her house, and uh, while I was there during that week, Officer Mason has actually came down and visited me to see that I was there, and he had talked to my mom, and uh, he just told me, he was like, you know, you're a very young girl, and... and you know, this life is not for you. This is not what you should be doing. And, you know, I, you know, at that time I was, you know, I I was thinking I was going to have my kid and, and I I was thought at the time that, that I was going to hopefully be able to be better and do better. And, um, a week later, uh, on my 18th birthday, I went in for a hearing and he dismissed everything said I didn't have to be on probation anymore and they dropped everything against me and then um I was still living at my mom's and her and her old man were you know you know still you know doing dope and running around and all that crazy stuff she'd leave me there with all the kids and everything all the time and you know crazy stuff and be gone for weeks on end and I'd be stuck there with the kids and then um November 2nd uh I had my daughter Um, it was a very, very hard labor. Um, I knew something was wrong with me the days prior and nobody wanted me to call the ambulance or take me into jail. They kept saying that it was just back to Nick's and, um, I went in and I delivered. It was over 24 hour delivery and, um, she came out, the cord was wrapped around her neck. She was healthy and, um, she was good. And, uh, Three days, two to three days later, I went home to my mom's house with my baby. And um, for a while there, I mean, it was different. It, it was a little stressful. I didn't really know how to be a mom. I didn't really know how to take care of a baby. I didn't, you know, I no one ever taught me anything. I, you know, I didn't know anything about life. And it was really hard. And then I had a lot of things, you know, a lot of animosity against my mom. And when she would try to give me input, I didn't want her help. Like, how are you going to tell me how to be with my kid? You weren't a mom to me, you know, type thing. And um, there was still a lot of chaos in the house and stuff. And then, you know, one day I was gone with my kid. And I was down the street at a girl I met, an older, an older lady. And, and, and she would go to meetings. And she took me to a meeting one time. And I went with her. It was my first ending meeting in Corona. <sighs> And I, and I was hanging out with her, and I, and I went home, and uh, my mom came out and, like, tried to attack me with my kid in my hands. And I was like, whoa, what the frick is wrong with you? And apparently, um, her boyfriend came home and, and uh, was drunk and belligerent and on drugs or whatever, and they were fighting, and he made, he made an insinuation that he had done something with me which, you know, like, sexually, which wasn't true, and I told her, you know, like, what the fuck, like, how can you, like, why would you believe that, like, why would you believe that I would even do something like that, like, what's wrong with you, she told me to get out, like, she literally threw me and my child to the street, and I had nowhere to go, and I had nothing for this man that she believed, and, 
I couldn't believe it. I was like, typical you, right? Like, always your men, never your children. That that was my mom's MO, always. And uh, proved it to be again. And um, so I went over to that girl's house with my daughter and my things. Um, and I was there for about a week. And then Donna came back and got me. And uh, I went back and I lived with her with my daughter. Um for a while and then I was like I was determined I was gonna do things on my own like I had to get out on my own I didn't want nobody taking care of me so me and Donna's daughter Erica we went and got uh we started staying at this place in Joshua Tree um the rent was really low um all I did was have to keep an eye on on uh her son that was kind of like mentally unstable and cook for them and stuff and so they they had one room and then like me and my I call Erica, my sister, me and my sister had another room with my kid, and that's where I was at, and then, I don't know, like, I, um, I started, like, hanging out with the same crowd, and I had them coming around, and, you know, next thing you knew, CPS was involved in my life, because the people that I was around, people would make call and make false accusations against me, and would say that I would leave my kid everywhere, and, you know, just dumb stuff because they didn't like me but they knew that that was the only way they can get to me because they couldn't get to me physically like a lot of these women that were making these false reports like had beef with me on the streets prior from like fights and or, or drug deals gone bad or whatever and they would make these like crazy false claims I mean I wasn't perfect but I wasn't doing meth at this time and I wasn't doing anything really illegal, you know, besides, I mean, just hanging out with these, this crowd again. And um, they would come over and they would harass me every once in a while, but there was really nothing that they could do because they didn't really have anything on me. Like, my daughter was well kept. I had a place. I had everything that I needed. She had all her, her, her necessities, you know, so there was nothing that they could really do to me. Um, and then, like, uh, one day, you know, I decided, I don't know, I was getting, I feeling depressed. I don't know, maybe it was postpartum. Um, I was just so sick of everything with, like, CPS and just not having help and, and, and not having anybody and not knowing what to do. And it was just hard being a mom. Like, I just wanted a release. I just, I just needed to get a relief and, and just step away from reality for a second. And I decided to go. And uh, when me and my daughter went down, um, to a girl's house that I knew and I freaking got high on this and like talk about like instant like kick in the butt like I'm there and like that morning I get a call from my sister she was like um our house is burnt down and I was like what she was like I'm standing in front of our house right now with mom the fire department is here and they are putting our house out our house is on fire and so, like, I got there as fast as I can. I didn't have a car, and even though I was right on the street, so I had the stroller, and I'm um, getting over there, and I pulled up, and, like, everything I had was just gone. 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 And um, they were questioning me, you know, who do I think that you did it? I, I didn't know. Like, I didn't know. I was like, man, there's so many people that I don't like me, that don't like me. Like, anybody could have did it on purpose. I don't know. I guess the fire chief was saying that it looked like the – the fire was started on the bed and it could have possibly happened from the window that was right in front of the bed and, and you know, and if I had enemies and it was just a lot and I was like, man, like, like, I don't know. Like, I, I just, I don't even know. And so my mom, Donna, well, I call her my mom, Donna, uh, took me and Erica, whatever we can, you know, um, salvage, you know, out of the wreckage later on that day. Uh, which was nothing, uh, <laughs> not, a, not, a, not a thing at all, really. And um, it took us back, and, and we were staying with her for a while, and um, everything was it was slightly okay. I, w I would still go down the street. I would still get high, and um, I, I just I was hanging around with the same crowd, and this crowd was just sucking the life out of me and just dragging me down. And, and I knew better, and I knew I shouldn't have been around them because at this point in my life, I had already knew that a lot of the things that they said that they were about, they weren't about. And everything they said that they were against, they would do. And it, it was just so, like, hypocritical. And, and, and yeah, at, at the time, I was like, 
you guys are like nothing. Like I, I don't even know why I'm around them, but they were the only people that I had, you know. And and I'm not gonna sit here and talk crap about all of them because despite what their beliefs were, some of them were not really about that, but were caught up in it just like me. And they were not bad people, um, but the majority of them were. And uh, one day, uh, uh, Donna and her dad and uh, Courtney and me and Erica were going to go to the mall, and all they had was five seats. So Erica had the bright idea, okay, well, my friend will babysit, you know, your daughter. Let's take her over there. And I'm just like, okay, you know, I mean, I've met them a couple times, and I knew they were all right, um, but I was like, all right, sure. And we took her there, and... Um, we went to the, the mall, and my sister decided she was going to steal. And so next thing you know, we're hemmed up in, in the back of the mall. And uh, um, time kind of got away. And when we finally got back up to the desert, I went to um, the place where I was supposed to be at. And uh, I was met with a CPS card and a cop card on the front door telling me they had took my daughter and um, to be in court at this time. And uh, my mom knew a couple of cop people, so she had talked to them, and and I guess the lady said that I had abandoned my kid, <laughs> which I didn't. And I was coming back, but it didn't matter. Um, Dykoff happened to be the one that took my child and uh, took her to the police station with uh, until CPS came and picked him up. and. Um, I have a firm belief that a lot of it was because he wanted me to turn in that 40 year old for, uh, you know, being with a minor and I refused to say anything or talk to the cops about him because I didn't want to have no one come after me. And so I truly feel that, that it had a lot to do with that. Like he had it out for me and, um, she was gone. And, um, instead of doing the smart thing and, and doing what I needed to do, like, I got really sad and depressed, and I cried, and uh, I was at my mom's that night, and uh, I remember um, waking up to the sound of a baby crying, and uh, I went to the kitchen, and I made a bottle, and I went over to her bed, she wasn't there, and uh, I, like I woke up all the way at this point and I just fell to the ground and I was crying and I wanted to die I wanted to die I, I was on a mission and I didn't like these people that did what they did to me and I just had so much anger and aggression and um so I went out and I plotted to uh, do something against these people and uh um the guy kind of got set up down the street and uh, barricaded in the house by a couple of dudes I knew, and they were going to hurt him, and uh, he blamed it all on his girlfriend and said that it was her. It was her idea because we needed, they needed to get to a party, and I wasn't back in time, so that's why they did it. And so they were like, okay, call your girl down. Call your girl down. And uh, so he called her down, and she's standing outside, and, and uh, he had took the kids away, and she didn't see me coming. And I just came around the corner and started beating the crap out of her. And um, I was getting her really good. And uh, she was down on the ground in a fetal position. And all I remember is her kid getting past the guy. And he's, he's like, stop, stop. My mom's pregnant. And uh, I froze. And I was like, what the heck? Like, I was like, what the heck? And the next thing I know, I see my homeboy just hitting that dude so hard that his head bounced off the side of the wall, concrete, boom, because he knew that he just effed me even more. And uh, I heard sirens in the distance, and we booked it. Um, I went on the run. I didn't get my daughter back. I didn't go to court. So I was scared I was going to go to jail. Um because I knew I hurt her and I knew she lost that baby 
and I thought she was going to tell on me. I thought she was going to make a police report, and so I left. Um, I went down to DHS, and I didn't, uh, with someone, and I didn't know anybody around there, and, like, we camped out, living homeless in the back of a, in a tent, in the back of Kmart, um, just trying to stay away from the desert as much as possible, and then I couldn't ha- I hang with that life. I couldn't hang with the tent life. It wasn't for me. Um, I could couch surf, but the tent life, I just couldn't do it, and so I hitchhiked from DHS all the way back up to Joshua Tree, you know, I was like, you know what, I don't even care, you know, they catch me, they catch me, um, I ended up getting, um, this dude, and the funny thing is, is, you know, he was Hispanic, and, uh, um, you know, at the time, you know, I liked him, and, and stuff like that, I knew his mom from the street, she would run, run, run around a little bit with, like, the people that I ran around with, and, uh, she was in jail, and, so like me and him hooked up and I was staying at her house with him and I promised her, you know, I would help him with her kids and, you know, me and him had some thing going and, you know, um, then, you know, I, I ended up still hanging out with those people that I shouldn't have been hanging out with and he didn't like it because I wouldn't take him around with me because I knew that it, I knew that I couldn't take him around those people with me because he was Hispanic and I knew that would cause me issues. So, and he didn't like that. I wouldn't take him with me anywhere and it caused a lot of problems and I ended up leaving. And, um, I was so bad on drugs. It, It was like, Oh, it was horrible. Like I, there was not a day that went by that I wasn't high. Um, I hated myself. I cried every day. Um, I knew I missed my daughter and, uh, but, uh, there was, there was nothing that I could do about it. Like she was gone and, uh, I knew I wasn't going to get her back because of the decisions that I had made. And, uh, so then, uh, um, uh, like I said, like I, I was just in this spiral down spiral, like everything that I was doing, I was running around doing things for these people. Um, I don't really want to get into too much detail about it because a lot of it was some pretty bad stuff. Like, uh, I was always the person that they would call, you know, to handle any of the females that got out of line around the area or any of the females that they had in trouble with. Like I was kind of like a female regulator for, for them. And, you know, I would put in a lot of work for them. And when I mean work, like, I mean, doing stuff, robbing, stealing, didn't matter. Um, I, I was doing that. And, uh, I, I, there was days where I wouldn't eat. I, I, there would be weeks where I wouldn't sleep. I remember times where I was hungry that I would even try to dig in the trash can because I, I hadn't eaten and I had no money and I had nothing and I hadn't showered or, or anything. And man, and just thinking back about it, it just makes my stomach turn because I just don't even know how I got to the point where I got with that. And, um, but I hated myself and I knew I wanted to die because a part of me felt like I was becoming my mother. And that was the last person that I wanted to be like, yet that's exactly who I was becoming. And I mean, I lost my child. I mean, she didn't even get us taken away, even though we should have been, but I I mean, I lost my kid and there was no replacing that. I didn't want to live. And, um, so, you know, time had went on and, um, I would say about, I was probably about, I guess six months pregnant at the time when I had found out that I was pregnant, but I was so freaking high and just so far gone that it didn't matter. And part of me thought like it was unfair for me to bring another child into this world or have and care for another kid when I left my other kid and I, I felt bad, but I couldn't stop. Like, I I didn't want to do it, and I didn't want to have a kid, but I knew I shouldn't have been getting high, but I couldn't stop. Like, I couldn't stop, and it, and it just kept eating at me and eating at me and eating at me, and I got, you know, I was already at this time caught up with another dude, and, you know, he would give me drugs, and even though he knew I was pregnant and, You know, it was just, it was sick, man. It was a sick, sick time that I, that I was, you know, dealing with. And, 
you know, I wasn't there in my brain and, you know, I, I, I just, I didn't care for nothing or no one and it didn't matter. Nothing that anyone would say to me, nothing that anybody could do for me. Like it didn't matter. Um, I just, I was, I was too far gone. I felt like I was too far gone and I, and I couldn't stop because even if I wanted to, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't have nobody. I didn't have no one I could call and turn to. I didn't have no money. I didn't have no food. I had nothing. And, um, I ended up delivering, um, September 10th, 2004, my daughter and I was already wanted by the police. Um, not for what I thought I was going to be wanted for. I thought I was going to be wanted for um, hurting that girl and her baby. And what I was wanted for was um, child abandonment um, because I never went to court. They stuck the child abandonment to me. And, um, you know, there was, it was what it was. There was nothing I could do about it. They took me to jail. Um, they knew that I was under the influence and, uh, um, two days later, they came in and they took my daughter into another room and they wheeled me in a wheelchair into another room. And the lady was asking me, you know, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but where so-and-so, and this was the dude that I was seeing at the time. And I guess he was under, you know, he was, they were looking for him or questioning, um, to a homicide and, uh, I was like, I don't know, and I, and I really didn't. I mean, I was hanged up in the hospital. I don't know where this dude goes. He's everywhere, you know what I mean? I, I didn't know, and, and that wasn't good enough for them. And, and you know, they of course, you know, they belittled me, which was, which was rightful, you know. I mean, I deserve to be called the names that I was called and told the things that I was told because, I mean, look what I was doing. Look what I did, you know what I mean? I was, I was to me, and I'm not saying anything about anybody who's ever been in my position, but to me, I felt at that moment that I was the scum of the earth. Like I was the scum of the earth. Like how can you do this to your child? How can you have a baby born under the influence? Like how can you do that? Like it didn't, like that's how I felt at the time. So anything they said to me, I felt was warranted. Like it it was well-deserved. And um, I ended up going to jail and I went to county. I was in there for a couple weeks. And they presented me, a lady came in while I was in the back, and they presented me with a um, uh, stack of paperwork. And they told me, you know, you need to look this over, and you need to sign her over. And I was like, sign who over? And they were like, sign your oldest daughter over. And um, they had told me that she had this wonderful family, and um, she had already been calling a mom, and she already had a brother in this big old house, and all this, you know, this like whole life that was something that obviously I couldn't give her at the moment. And she told me that, you know, they loved her and that, you know, um, if I was to fight for her, that, uh, I was going to lose both my kids. They weren't going to give me a chance for both my kids. They said, if you sign over, you know, uh, Penelope, then, uh, we'll give you a chance to make it right with Christina. And so, I was like, you know, at the time it was hard and I thought about it and I was like, I knew that I didn't have a life to take her back right now. And so where she was at, the way they made it sound, it was probably the best for her. And so I signed her over and, uh, I ended up being released, um, like, uh, you know, like two weeks after whatever, not even two weeks, but I was released. And, uh, that night I was staying at some guy's house and, um, I hadn't gotten high, and uh, the guy that I was uh, seeing had ended up coming over and uh, with another dude that I was really close with, and um, it, they ended up, you know, we were, they were going to go down into town, and I wanted to ride down into town, and so, you know, I hopped in the truck with them, you know, I wasn't thinking anything of it, and before we ever got out of the driveway, we were surrounded by police and uh, from every angle. And I was just like, my head fell down into my lap because I was just told, like, not even that long before, like, if, like, 
I was to get caught up with anybody or be around with anybody or get arrested, like, I was going back to jail. I was going to be in trouble. So I was just like, oh, my God, this is not happening to me. You know what I mean? And um, I remember the cop, they, they uh, pulled him out the driver's side, and they pulled me and the other two people out the passenger side. It was a truck. And, uh, you know, I kind of knew, but I really kind of didn't know, like, everything that was in the vehicle. And so, like, I know when he got out, there was, like, dope on his side. And uh, I guess there was, like, shotguns underneath our feet, underneath the floorboard. And there were shotguns behind the seats, you know. And I was just like, oh, my God, like, this is really happening right now. Like, this would be, like, my luck right now. Like, you know, like, I'm, I'm damned, damned if I do, damned if I don't type thing, you know. And um, so... At first, you know, the cop was going to try to try to pin the dope on me. And, you know, like, you know, I'm about that life was about that life. And so I'm no snitch, but I'm definitely not going to sit there and take the rap for something that wasn't mine, especially when I had a lot more to lose. And I'm just like, you know, it ain't mine. I don't know who it is, but it ain't mine. Nothing in there is mine. I was just getting a rap, you know, and um, they were really going to try to pin it on me. They were trying to say that I was under the influence. I wasn't. I was really upset. And when I'm upset, I get shaky, I get sweaty, I cry, I start rambling because I get frustrated. And I was really upset and frustrated that this guy that is a dude that I was seeing wasn't speaking up for me. And he wasn't like, you know, taking the blame for anything. And I was going to get in trouble for it. So, like, I was, I was like, furious furious and and so they were trying to say that i was on the influence and i was like test me test me you know so they go and they put me back in the holding tank in the holding tank and then next thing i know um they're coming in talking about you're getting or and i was like um okay you know i didn't i didn't know what to think about it but they're like yeah we're we're gonna ticket you and we're gonna let you out and that's what they did um they let me go and uh I went on my way, and uh, I walked all the way from the jail back to a girl's house I knew at the apartment complex, and uh, I would want to say I was there for about a few hours, and then I got high, you know, I went and got high, because I was, I don't know why, you know, I just, it, that's, you know, that's addiction for you, man, like, it doesn't matter, you could have your whole life being threatened to be taken from you, and you would still go and, you know, get that get that fixed and you know that's what it was for me so I, I got I got loaded and then um, I get a phone call and uh, the girl who was there at the apartment complex she was like hey because um, her man was in the rehab and um, I guess that there was some beds that they needed to fill before county came and um, I guess because they could lose funding or whatever however that works and I was like, all right. Um, they were like, do you want to you wanna come down? You want to come down? You want to come to the rehab? We got a bed here. And I was like, are you serious? And they were like, yeah, we, we need to fill this bed. And I was like, yeah, sure, bet. Be here by 8.30. All right. And I did. I got loaded because I knew I was getting there. And then I went around to several of the houses that um, I would hang at because I would bounce around and collected a few of my things from each of them. And then uh, one of my good friends, um, he took me, him and his girl took me to rehab and, and uh, dropped me off there at Panorama Ranch in Joshua Tree. And, uh, you know, I cried. I sat there the whole, through the whole interview and I was just crying because um, I couldn't, like, I had this weird feeling come over me and I didn't know what it was, but it, it was a little bit like a sense of relief. You know, like, I knew, I didn't know what I was going to do and I didn't know where I was going, but I knew um, that something good was about to happen, and I didn't know how to intercept it, and um, I stayed there, and uh, the next day, I tried to sleep in, and and uh, the guy who was there, his name was Marshall, he came in, he was like, no, no, we don't do this here, you know, there was no sleeping in, there was no recuperating, there was none of that, and so I was a little salty, and, and uh, you know, he was like a, a way, like, oh, over six foot tall, military, um, big black dude. And so, you know, um, I already had my guard up, 
you know, from, from my trauma or whatever. And he went to shake my hand when we were in the morning meetings about to do the devotion. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. And he looked at me dead in my eye and he was like, we're going to change that. And, uh, he did. <laughs> um, they came and they were like, you know, we're not going to give her a kid. We don't think that we're going to give her the opportunity. And he sent me out the office one day and he stayed in there at CPS and uh, it took like two hours. And I remember it was like the longest two hours of my life. And uh, they called me back in and they said, if you stay here and you finish this program and you do every single thing that you're supposed to do, you jump through every single hoop that we want you to jump through with probation, us and everything else. And you go do these meetings and you do everything, we will consider you having your daughter back. So I was like, all right, bet. And uh, I would do everything. I finished the 90-day program and I completed it. Um, I actually completed it December 24th of uh, um, 2004. And uh, I went in and I went right down the street and I was living in the sober living. And uh, I was doing meetings all the time and... You know, everything was good, and um, I, I met this guy there, though, and uh, um, we did fool around while he was in the rehab, while I was up there visiting. Um, I don't know how we got away with that, but we did, and I ended up pregnant, and uh, I was still living in sober living. I was working. I was doing everything CPS was telling me, um, and it, you know, everything, and you know, the guy knew I was pregnant, but then I had heard that, you know, he was messing around with some other girls that were up there. So I was like, you know, I lied to him and I told him like, you know, that I was going to have an abortion and I just went along my merry way. You know, I didn't even think nothing about it. Um, I was working. Um, I was doing my meetings. I was doing my counseling. I was doing my, my testing, my check-ins for, for probation. I was doing every single thing they asked me to do. I stayed away from all those people that I was hanging around. I never went back to them. Um, I never, you know, was associating them with them anymore. I left it. It was dead to me. You know, that life was dead to me. I, I, I was, I said, I, like, I'm not going back to that. That's not the way I want to live. That's not the belief system I want to have. I, I shouldn't be having these beliefs and placing them on a group when it was one person just because one person does something, that doesn't mean everyone's like that. And I was letting what this one man did to me, and I, I was taking it out and using it as an excuse to be a horrible person, and I wasn't going to do that no more. Um, uh, I still wasn't into really into God yet. I maybe went to church once or twice with a lady that I considered my sponsor. Um, I really wasn't, you know, really into it, you know, or anything like that. Um, I was doing the meetings um, and all that. But not as frequent as I should have been um, because I was working and I had everything else going on and it was just me and I would ride a bus and, you know, I was doing everything on my own. Um, about a year after being in sober living, uh, no, not a year, about, it was about, I was eight months pregnant. Yeah, no, it was about uh, maybe nine months into being in the sober living um, and I was about to be having the baby. Um, I had saved enough money from working and doing everything that I was to get a little studio apartment and CPS had helped me furnish it. And, um, I was doing everything I needed to do. They were like, you know, you're stellar. You could be a poster child for people who get it right. You know, all that, you know, good stuff. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm doing it. I, I'm, I'm turning around. I was looking good. I was doing everything. I felt good about myself. Um, I was having my visits with my daughter and, and we were bonding and I knew, that I, I didn't want her to hate me and, you know, I, I wanted to have, you know, her back and I'd already was never ever going to see one child again and I, I didn't want that to ever happen. Um, they allowed me to keep my son out of out of the system, which was good. Um, normally, when you have another child where you have a CPS case, they don't do that. Normally, they take custody of them too, but they weren't going to do that because I was doing so good. Um, ap uh, after about... 18 months, uh, well, I'm getting a little too bit far ahead of myself. I had my son uh, September 13th, 2005. That was exactly a year and three days after my daughter, Christiana. And um, I had him and he was living there with me in, um, you know, the, the one bedroom, I mean, the studio. And uh, his dad caught wind that I actually did have a child and popped up one day and um, 
I don't know what the heck I was thinking. I, I must have been lonely. Whatever it was, I allowed him to come around, and he was there. Um, we started building our relationship. It was going good at, at first, you know. It, you know, I mean, but it was for all the wrong reasons. You know what I mean? I, I wanted to have his father there and be with the person that I had a kid with and try to make it work because this guy truly I mean yeah he had a drug problem but he's never been to prison and he didn't have like no tattoos and he you know he was, it really wasn't all that bad for for the, the way we live life he would have been considered a square even though he did drugs you know because that's how he, he street he wasn't you know and so I was like you know I'll you know I'll give it a give it a shot he was supposedly clean so you know we were gonna try to make it work um after 18 months of having this dps case uh, my daughter was given back to me fully um then we ended up getting a uh bigger place me and him um that was a two-bedroom in the same complex and um uh i we ended up already planning on getting married and so like he had you know got me you know this little ring from walmart and you know we were talking about it he was gonna get this big old settlement because he was hit by a, a water district truck out here when he was a kid and so he had like all this money that was gonna come and so we were gonna have this good old wedding this church wedding and you know all this stuff and um i ended up finding out that i was pregnant again and uh uh we ended up getting married while I was pregnant. Uh, my son was a couple months old. Uh, we got married in uh, 2006. And, uh, you know, it was all right. You know, uh, he was a little off at times. And after we got married, he started thinking he was going to come really controlling. Um, I, around this time, I found out that I had uh, mild dysplasia which was the beginning um, cell stages of cancer down in uh, my cervix. And so I was having a very hard pregnancy. Um, I was very sick a lot. I had to be put on bed rest and I gained a lot of weight. And um, he would like try to treat me like if he felt like he could like, you know, overpower me or control me and just was acting 100% different than how, who he was before we got married, um, which I found very weird. And um, uh, I ended up having my daughter and uh, I, you know, I was like, you know, I'm determined I'm going to make this work, you know, uh, nothing, some counseling couldn't fix, right? <laughs> uh, and he was on medication and stuff like that. And, you know, I was just like, you know, we're not going to be able to have it work out here with this family in California. And so um, my mom, Donna, at the time, I was living out in Indiana. And uh, she was like, you know what? Come out here and, you know, live out here. It's cheaper and everything. So I was like, all right, bet. So I was like, I, I, I'm on probation, so that wasn't going to work. So I took it to my PO, and I was like, you know, what can I do? And he was like, well, you could be able to go up to an early release because you, you do everything you're good, you know? And so we took it to court. Um, I went up for early release. They also took my charges and dropped them from felonies to a misdemeanor and then dismissed them. And uh, I was able to leave the state of California and go to Indiana. And uh, we drove out there and we're living out there um, in the, like a townhome. And, uh, you know, my cousin, it came out to help me for a little bit, but that wasn't working out really well because uh you know she couldn't be that long without her drugs so we started fighting and then she went back and mind you this whole time i was clean and um then you know like me and him would fight a lot and it would just be a lot of problems and he started getting like really like crazy and psychotic and doing really like shady scammer stuff and like he ended up getting in trouble for stealing t uh, like phone cards from from the store and like a bunch of stuff and was just putting us in a lot of crap and you know eventually I you know um was like man like I need someone to come and help me because I couldn't depend on him to watch the kids like I would come home and like my kids would be running around with diapers like to their freaking knees and they looked all dirty like he wasn't just he just sat there and didn't do nothing and you know it would always just be like oh I was miserable I was starting to become miserable and I was starting to get those feelings back again like I just man I hate 
I'm, I'm really hating my life right now, you know? My kids are wonderful, and I wanted to do everything for them, but I was hating my life. Um, around this time, like, my mom, it got really bad, and, and uh, I was getting calls from my sister because they were going to put her in jail because she hadn't been going to school, but I, I knew it wasn't her fault. I knew it was my mom's fault. And so, you know, I, I persuaded, the, you know, the campus, you know, the school police that was dealing with it and then the other cops and the social worker you know hey you know i'll pay for my sister to come out you know let me get guardianship of her and you know i'll make sure she's in school so they were able to persuade my mother to sign over temporary guardianship that if she did that they wanted to arrest her and take her to jail and so she did that my sister came out and lived with me um she was barely 16 years um at the time and uh, she was working, and, and we were doing good and all that stuff. And, um, you know, uh, we would fight all the time, and she didn't like him. And, you know, he would say things to her that was wrong and, and stuff like that. And so I would kick him out all the time. And uh, he just wasn't good. I felt like he was a little bit too rough on my kids all the time. And, you know, uh, we, just, we just weren't getting along at all, and I wasn't happy in that marriage. Um, during this time... Um, I had also ended up contacting and getting uh, in contact with, you know, my boyfriend when I was 14, that, my first love. But he was in a relationship. And so, like, we had a brief, um, we had a brief, you know, like, conversation, but it wasn't nothing, like, of that nature and stuff. I was married. He was with somebody. But it was just like a hi, hey, you know, whatever. But I'm not going to say that the thought didn't go through my head, like, dang, man, like, you know, like, he was good to me, you know, he wasn't the best person, but he was good to me, you know, and, um, uh, he found out that I was talking to him and he busted up my computer and shattered my computer. And, uh, you know, it was just like always just hell. And I didn't want to be with him anymore. And I just didn't know how I was going to get out of it. Having three babies. I mean, they were all a year apart, you know, and you know, my youngest, she was not even a year old. My son was a year and, and my, my my daughter was two and I just didn't know what I was going to do I didn't really have anybody to help me and I didn't know how I was going to get out of the situation I was in and then um, one day um, out of nowhere it was uh, July 8th uh, 2008 um, I got a phone call and uh, it was in the, it was morning my time and uh, they told me that my little brother had died, and um, it, it was a very uh, shocking thing for me and my sister. Um, that was my younger brother right underneath me, but that was her, uh, his, and her dad and her, her mom. They had the same dad and mom, um, and uh, so she fell out, blacked out, and uh, I made the decision that day. That I was selling everything in my apartment, and I was heading back on the ground with my kids to California. I didn't know what I was going to do, what I was going to do when I was getting there, but I was going to make it work because my mom was nowhere to be found and all my brothers and sisters needed me. And I thought that I was in the position to see them. Uh, um, we ended up coming back here and uh, burying, burying my brother. Um, and it was hard. It was very hard because I had to keep it together. I don't really think that I had the chance to grieve because I had to be there for my sister and uh, for my, my little brother and my little sister because my older brother, was he's already been in prison for several years at this point. Um, he ended up getting uh, like 15 or 16 years. Um, so he had already been in. And uh, so I had to be there for them. And it was, uh, was not an easy time at all. Um, my cousin ended up helping me get into like a little trailer with my family in 29 Palm. And um, we went there and then uh, me and him were still having issues. And my sister ended up going towards their dad because she felt bad for him. And, um, you know, it was all good. You know what I mean? Like I understood. I mean, I didn't like her father, but, you know, I, I wasn't going to stop her from doing what she wanted to do. You know, she felt that she needed to do it and I, I let her do it. Um, me and him just we weren't seeing it I was uh, I started going back to school for my GED and I, and I was working on top of everything and then um I would hear like you know little things little snippets like he you know he was being this and this around the neighborhood or whatnot and then uh one day my little sister uh 
told me that she had seen him, you know, being flirtatious and saying some things to a girl who was in the trailer park who was only 16 years old. And at this time, he was already 20-something years old, and and I was like, what the heck? And so we had gotten a fight that day, and I was like, I'm going to find out. Trust me, I'm going to find out. And uh, I went to work, and I came back, and I, uh, my daughter, she was acting funny, and I didn't know, you know, uh, you know, what had happened, so I, you know, went to, like, change her diaper and check her, and she had, like, a black mark down, like, a handprint. It was black and blue, like, almost covered both of her butt cheeks, and, like, I about lost it. I about lost it, and, um, I went off on him, and I kicked him out of the house, and I said, you know, um, like, I wasn't gonna let nobody put hands on my kids, you know what I mean? Especially for just getting into the refrigerator, and uh, that night he slept in his truck and went to work that morning from his truck. And um, uh, I, I left that morning, went to the Unity home, and uh, I went and uh, went to the Unity home, which was like a domestic violence shelter. And I told them that he was abusing me, even though that really wasn't fully the case. I didn't want to tell them what he did to my daughter because I didn't want them thinking that... Uh, you know, that, um, I did something. I didn't want CPS coming back in my life and me getting my kids taken away. And, um, they helped me, um, file the, the report and, uh, they posted it on that house the same day, had me caving, took me and all my kids out of there and, uh, took us, you know, over somewhere else and uh served him and i never seen him again i never seen him again and uh that that was that you know i was like i'm not going back to him and you know i ended up going over to this girl's house that was like his cousin um and uh she was letting me stay there and i didn't know at the time that they were getting high and i was dealing with all this stuff with my cervical cancer and, and things like that and trying to get that taken care of like i just got a biopsy and and all that and um they uh they were getting loaded man and and i don't know why just like everything with my brother kind of creeped up on me and and i had a moment and i relapsed and i um it was not a moment that i'm proud of because i knew that i didn't want to do it and i don't i still to this day i don't understand that's addiction for you like that's what i did and i did it and uh, um, it wasn't that long of a run. It was only about uh, like a couple of months because I did end up talking to the guy again from when I was 14. And um, uh, we ended up, he ended up getting out and he was talking to me, telling me, you know, he wanted to get his life together, but he knew he couldn't, you know, and uh, just regularly. And so I was like, you know, I was gonna help him, but I didn't tell him that I was getting loaded. And so he came up to 29 and uh, was living with me and was helping me with the kids. We were living in, you know, this house. And um, he was like, you know, let's get out of here. You know, let's go. So we, we left to Indiana um, over to his mom's and uh, I stopped using. And, uh, but I didn't get into the, I didn't get into any meetings. I didn't go back to any meetings and I, and I wasn't getting into church. I wasn't replacing anything. You know, I just stopped using and I was going to work. And I was doing everything that I needed to do, and I stayed straight, and and, and life was pretty good, you know. Like um, he cleaned up his life, and um, we actually uh, he became a really good dude. And some things didn't work out uh, because he violated, because he was on parole, and he shouldn't have left the state. And so uh, they ended up coming out there and transporting him back. And so a little shortly after, with me working and everything, I found my way back to here. And I was going to try to figure out everything to make it work for him to get out. Not everything was going as planned, but I was going to make it work. Um, we ended up living with his brother's ex-girlfriend, and I was staying there. She was going to help me out, and uh, he got out. And then uh, we ended up moving to Yucaipa, and uh, we lived out there for a couple years, and I was clean. I mean, he relapsed, and, um, you know, we had, you know, our little times, and he barely fell off. 
you know, and, I, and I'm and i not going to say like a full relapse, it's kind of like a lapse, like he did it one time, got caught, because I caught him and drug tested him, and told him that he couldn't, and I made him told his pro officer, and uh, then he went back to being clean again, and he was like, look, if we're going to be together, we can't be here, you know, um, I can't be in California, it's not going to work, I'm going to end up getting loaded, and you know, all that good stuff, so I was like, all right, you know, you know, let's do this, so, um, it was like, um, March 5th, 2000, no, March 4th, 2012, we drove and his family followed us and we passed through Vegas and, uh, on our way there on March 5th, um, 2012, uh, we got married and then, uh, March 6th, 2012, we left to Michigan, um, from 2012 to 2014, we were in Michigan and everything was good. We had good jobs and I was doing good and I was starting to get into church and I was starting, you know, to, you know, uh, have a relationship with God. I felt, um, there was something inside of me that just, you know, I knew that I needed to be something and I needed to do something with my life. Like I had a story to tell and I knew I can use that. And, um, I uh, was going back to school, and at that, uh, this time, in like 2013, I had, had already got my associates, and I was going back to um, school to get my bachelor's, and uh, I don't know why, but my brother and him put it in our head, like, you know what, let's, you know, let's move to Arizona. My dad was there, and I was like, sure, you know, cool, why not, and uh I felt like it was the wrong thing, and I went against my gut, and we went to Arizona, and then um, not too long after that, where we were in Arizona, uh, he ended up relapsing, and uh, it, this time, it was a pretty hard time, and um, I, for all the wrong reasons, felt like I needed to find out what was going on I thought I can save him and and all this stuff that you know I know now wasn't true and and um I felt like I had this thing in my mind and I know it was the disease telling me you know if you just get high you could infiltrate the people that he's around and keep them away from him and I really thought that was the reason why I was gonna do it and and I did and I got high and uh oh I felt so bad and none of it was a good time and it, it was it was nothing this time around it was it was not the same it was not at all the same and I had done some really bad stuff to a lot of people trying to keep them away from him um to the point where I thought that someone might kill me or I was going to end up in prison because like I was literally like pulling guns on people and doing crazy off the wall stuff thinking that I was going to get them to stay away from him and I had my breaking point, and I was like, you know what? I can't do this. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do this. Like, this is not what I should be doing. Like, I know better than this. Like, what am I doing, you know? And uh, I, I stopped, and I said, you know what? I'm filing for divorce. And I, I, I went to wash my hands with him, and I told him I was done. And um, long story short, I did, fi I did file, and when he found out... Um, he was going to try to kill himself and he was riding around on the bike with a gun in his hand. And I was driving behind him on the phone with the police telling him, you know, um, like he's going to hurt himself. He's going to kill himself. And I thought it, I thought Arizona would have been like California where, you know, if you're married and you tell them something like that, they're going to 5150 them. But that's not the case in Arizona because that's not what they did. Um, they ended up getting him and charging him for being a felon with a firearm. And they took him to jail that night. Um, Arizona's a little bit different, and because they didn't have a case built up on him, they did end up releasing him that night. And um, he came home, and he begged me. He was like, please, don't don't leave me. Don't file for divorce. I'll get clean. I'll stop. And I was like, you know what? I'll give you a chance. But, you know, the only way that we're going to do this is if you figure out how we can get back to Michigan. That's it. you got to figure out how you're going to have your job back, how we're going to have a place. And that's the only way, way I'll stop the divorce, and he did. And so we ended up 2015 going back to Michigan and, uh, we were out there and I, uh, dive head first, um, in, in, into church. And I got really good at it, in with a, a lot of people like the women's groups. Um, I didn't 
NA, and I'm not saying anything bad about NA. I, I like NA. I believe in the step. But it wasn't NA meetings and stuff wasn't for me. Um, sometimes a lot of the people in those types of settings or groups are still not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And a lot of them like to be there and they like to like one up a lot. The meetings that I've been to, this is not for everyone. And I'm not saying for all of them, but I didn't have a good experience with that, with that type of setting. So it wasn't working for me. So I didn't continue to go to meetings, but I got in with, um, some of, you know, uh, like the, the church groups and they had their own kind of recovery group within the church. It was Metro city in, uh, in Michigan. You, and, and, um, a lot of people probably heard of it. It's a big known church out there in Michigan. And, um, uh, I was doing really good. And, um, and about, uh, 20 towards the end of 2016, um, they, uh, him and, um, requested that he come back to Arizona uh, he was fighting his case for a couple months, and he ended up getting time out of it. And so while I was left in Michigan with the kids and the house and everything, um, he had to go back and do time. Um, during this time while he was gone, I took this time to really invest myself in in working on myself. And I got in with in really good, and I was studying the Bible and reading scripture and, and getting in with church. Um and I met a wonderful group of ladies in my women's group, and they knew about my life. They knew about um, the type of person that I was, and they didn't judge me. Um, they looked at me, and they, you know, they were just good people. And, you know, I had always, you know, fell into this, you know, you know, like, I didn't want to hang out with bad people anymore. You know, like God says in first Corinthians, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. And so I had had it in my head. Like I'm not going to ever hang around with bad people. I'm going to always make conscious, you know, conscious choices of the type of people that I have in my life. And so that's what I kept doing. Um, so I submitted myself, you know, um, I submitted myself to God and I surrounded myself with people that were, knee deep in church and they they were really good um god fearing awesome people and um oh man i got in so good with god i submitted myself you know and i felt like i felt like this change in me there was this shift in me and it's and it's hard to explain and um it goes back to the scripture in james 4 7 submit yourselves therefore to god resist the devil and he will flee from you and i felt like like it was taken from me like the the power of addiction had been removed from me i felt i never felt that way ever in my life and i knew that god was working inside of me that there I, he put on my heart that there was something for me to be in this world everything that i went through and everything that i experienced it all had a meaning and it was all meant for something it wasn't meant for nothing it was not and I know that deep in my heart that God has a purpose for me. And it was to take everything that I've been through in my life and it was to utilize me out there in the world to help other people. And at the time with when I was when, when I was with these like I knew it in me and I and I kind of felt it and they were kind of telling me, like, you know, you have a testimony, you have a story, you need to do something with that. And I would and I wouldn't really tell them, but I, I would I, you know, one of the ladies I would tell her, her name was Stephanie and she's such a wonderful woman and I and I thank that woman with all my life because she, she helped me get on the path that I'm in with, with um drug and alcohol counseling and, and I will forever be appreciative of her because she she planted that seed in my head that I could and I should and I should not let nothing stop me and she pep prep you know, she would pet me up and cheer me up and she was like one of my greatest cheerleaders, you know what I mean? And um I I had an excuse though, you know, like I can't I can't. I felt like because I didn't have my oldest daughter and I didn't know where she was, and I I didn't feel like I was 100% good and right. And that was my excuse. And I kept telling them that for a couple months. Like, you guys, I can't. Like, there's just something. There's this missing piece of the puzzle um, of my life that I don't feel like I can go out there and I can share this message and I can share all this hope and, and stuff like that because part of me, I it wasn't all the way together yet. 
and they would pray for me and they would pray and I would pray and I'd be like, God, please just help me find it. And I kid you not, November 2017, I got a Facebook message and it was from my daughter. She was looking for me to find me. And um, at first I thought it was a joke. I couldn't believe it. I I mean, it it was just so crazy that all this stuff was happening to me that I, I thought it was too good to be true. There was no way that this was happening to me not me I'm not a good person you know why and uh it was true and um January I took a trip out to California to see her for the first time and I spent like uh, a week with her and I see my brother too and the first time after um 16 almost 17 years because uh he was in prison and he had just got out and so I just felt all that when I came came here and um I went back to Michigan and I literally stepped in the door and my kids looked at me and they're like we're leaving aren't we we're moving and I was like yeah I I had made the mind it up in my mind that I was leaving Michigan because I didn't have nobody out there and I was coming back over here and bringing my family over here um to make a life for them and to be able to be around uh their sister and I, I and I didn't have a plan. Once again, I didn't have a plan. We sold we sold our house, and I was like, God, you know, guide me, God, if if, if this is what you want me to do, and this is what I'm supposed to do, make everything easy and, and get me there. And He did. He did. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed endlessly for things to work out. And we ended up back here in California, and I was able to have my daughter, you know, um, back in my in my life. And, and she forgave me and it, it was just, it was good. You know, my, my kids were all together and I had my family and, um, at this time I came back and I graduated and I was able to walk, um, in, uh, 2018 for my bachelor's degree in, uh, healthcare administration. And, um, I was able to have my daughter and all my kids and my brother and, uh, I even invited my mom <laughs> to 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 my graduation to see me graduate. No, none of us have ever graduated. Nobody's been to college in my family, yet. and I, me, me, the first one, the most messed up one, you know, was able to do that. And it was just, it it was a good day because I was so proud of myself, and I was able to see my kids be proud of me. And I've never felt that way before in my life. And I knew, and I was still talking to the ladies back in Michigan, and they were like what's your excuse now what's your excuse that was your one excuse and now you have that god gave that to you you asked him for it he gave it to you so what's your excuse i don't have one i didn't have one so i made the choice and a couple months later after i graduated from my bachelor's to turn around and switch my whole um everything that i was going to school for i i I turned it around my whole major and I went and I enrolled in Grand Canyon University, which is a Christian um, university. I went online, um, it's out of Arizona, um, for my master's in um, uh, substance abuse. And uh, and um, two years I did of school and um, clean everything, church, working, kids, raising life just 100 percent better than it's ever been um being able to be around my daughter and everything and and i I just felt like i never felt before like i was belonging and i knew that because the fact that i was doing what god wanted me to do that i was getting blessed in my life you know um i was receiving a lot of blessings a lot of things that i knew i felt i didn't deserve you know um, I had had so much things happen to me in my life. I, I, I was like, you know, uh, for a long time, I had to get it out of my head and I had to pray for it to come out of my head because I felt like it was too good to be true. But then I knew, like, you know, like how First Peter 5.10 states, you know, after you have suffered a little while and God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. I knew at that point that I was strengthened and confirmed and established, and I knew that I was doing what I, what I was supposed to be doing, and I was on that right path. And uh, I graduated, 
and I was already um, interning at a place in Colton, um, already doing it, already helping out other people in recovery. And uh, I graduated September um, of 2020. And uh, now I got a job with in Moreno Valley, and I work for uh, Providence Recovery Centers in Moreno Valley. And I am the head um, counselor there. I'm still working towards having, you know, uh, my certifications and everything to be state certified, to be able to do things on my own. But I have helped already. So many women have came through and I have shared my story and have helped them. And I share, you know, my testimony and I tell them how God has worked in my life and how I know that he can work in theirs because if he can save me, he could save me and he could change me. Man, he could do anything, anything. And I seen it with my own eyes. I went from being pagan and into witchcraft and not even thinking about God to be totally invested in into the word and being totally invested in to following what he wants me to do. It's not my will, God, it's your will. It's what you want me to do. I'm living for you. I'm not living for me. I'm not living for the 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 world and and the worldly ways i'm living for your ways and what you need me to do and i'm abiding by you lord and and that's what i say every single day and i always say a prayer every night before i go to bed lord please if i have done anything please forgive me i am still learning but i am i am promising you that i will continue to do your work in your name every day and that's what i have done and let me tell you it is so good to to be clean and feel like when I even think about dope or, or, or they have girls that come across me and they come in there and they're loaded, it, like, my stomach turns and I get this sick, ill feeling and it's not a feeling of like, like I want that. Like before, like I have, it, it's hard to explain like like the feeling that God has given me to be able to feel and to, to get over the addiction is so powerful. I feel like he has removed the addiction from me. He has removed my want or, or anything or my cravings or anything for drugs, period, has totally been removed from me. And I know that. And I know, like, that could be con- controversial a lot with you know na and stuff like that because i know they say a lot of the times like you know um you know you're an addict you're an addict for life but i'm a child of god and i feel that i don't have to be marked by a label for the rest of my life the only label that i want for the rest of my life is the fact that i am a child of god and and i will live for him and i will do what he asks of me and i'm not a slave to no drug i'm not a slave to no substance I'm not a slave to none of that. I broke the chains, and I am I am so much more happy. And I have done so much work on myself with forgiveness. I forgave every single person who has ever done anything to me in my life. I had, I've had faces to face with my mom's boyfriend, and I have forgiven them, and I have forgiven my mother, and I have forgiven everybody who has ever hurt me. And it's the most... A rejuvenating feeling it's the most freeing feeling to let go of everything that has happened to you in your life and just be free god does that god does that and for me that might not be what works for everybody else but that's what worked for me god worked for me god took me from the streets being abused neglected raped hurt stomped on drugged out being a horrible person out there still and thieving doing whatever I had to and he turned me into who I am today he could do it for anybody anybody and I am a firm believer of that and I, I, I am just so happy and I get to see my kids be proud of me with the work that I do and they're watching me work with these women and oh man I am going to just keep on doing everything that I need to do to glorify God. Um, my next goal, I have a goal, and it's within a five-year plan. My youngest will actually be out of my house because two of my girls um, have plans on going into the military. Uh, my son, he hasn't made up his mind yet, but I know he'll get there. And uh, I have a goal for the new house that I bought. 
back in Yucca Valley, made a full circle to the place where it all started because I want to do work out here in this desert and I want to work with people who are troubled youth so they don't fall into the depths of, of those crowds and to the lots of what is out there in the, of, the, of this world because that's not what it is. It doesn't matter what happens to you in life. You do not have to submit to it. You do not have to give in to it. You do not have to try to think that you're going to put a Band-Aid over it or cover it up or put it away with any kind of substance because at the end of the day, it's always going to be there. It's always going to be there. You have to face it. And I want to help change people. And so my goal is in five years is I want to turn my home into my own rehab because they have no rehabs up here in the Morongo Basin. And I want to make an all-women's rehab out here so I can help women out here in this desert who are struggling like me and who are in my shoes to help them see different, to help them feel different, to help them turn their lives around and hopefully free them from the chains of addictions themselves. And that is my goal. And I know with God by my side that I will achieve anything. I am Nicole Shaver and I am drug-free and I know recovery works. Thank you.